What's up? It's Jalen Thompson of the Identity Crisis Podcast. Dylan Schweitzer. Dylan, we're going to do something different today, man. It's going to be a short, quick, sweet one, hopefully. Switching it up. Yeah, just a little bit. Uh, we're going to talk about something a little personal today. Uh-oh. What are your top three, if you can narrow it down to three, favorite books of the Bible and why? Oh, I like it. That's a good topic. Yeah. yeah. So what do you think? Oh, you want me to go first? You can, or do you want me to go first? I think you should kick it off. Okay, I will. So my first one off the top is Genesis. Okay. Reason, the reason why I say Genesis is because um, I can honestly read the book of Genesis from uh, from start to finish, and I can see every single problem that we face in humanity right now in the book of Genesis that was written thousands of years ago um, at this point. Um, so it tells me everything I need to know about people, uh, human nature. Uh, it tells me everything I need to know about evil. It tells me everything I, everything I need to know about good. It tells me everything I need to know about uh, uh, the way we think, the way we process information. Uh, it tells me everything I need to know, start to finish. I can, I can, I can point at something in Genesis, uh, and it will correlate to what's going on right here, right now, today in 2023. Um, my next book would be, and I'm stuck because I wanted to do five of these, but you said three. Uh, um. But my next book would be Ecclesiastes, okay. Um, because you know King Solomon's my man, uh, so I I I, uh, I I thoroughly enjoy his 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 teachings. But um, the reason why I say Ecclesiastes is because he wrote it at the end of his life, okay. Um, and it was kind of like a reflection on the kind of life that he lived, and um, and it was uh, uh, very insightful in terms of what life could look like if you remove God from uh, from our reality mm-hmm. and kind of what we're left with and what we're left to pursue, what's what's worth living for mm-hmm. once you remove God. And King Solomon um, found that there wasn't too much of anything worth living for. And this was a guy who was extremely wealthy, extremely wise, um, slept with more women than probably you and I have made eye contact with in our entire life. And um, But at the end of the day, uh, one of the last verses that he wrote in Ecclesiastes was, uh, the end of all matters, all has been said. Mm-hmm. Uh, fear God and keep his commandments for this is the whole duty of man and that's what he had to say after mm-hmm. that kind of lifestyle that he lived yeah. which says a lot um, and then the uh, final book I would say is uh, John Okay. and the reason I say the book of John is because um, that's where I would go to figure out who Jesus uh, really was um, not saying that the other three gospels don't do that because all four gospels kind of paint Jesus in uh, different lights from different perspectives. I think John kind of encapsulates all four of them in his gospel um, and paints Jesus to be who he ultimately claimed to be, which is God in the flesh. Mm-hmm. So that's what, those are my three. So what would be your two honorable mentions then? Yes, since I'm glad you, you brought it up. Yes. Since you wanted to do five. Yep. So um, my honorable mentions would be Proverbs, uh, which is okay. once again written by King Solomon. Proverbs because um, I can it, you just, good just yes good good wisdom. Mm-hmm. You don't even have to be a believer in Jesus Christ to apply Proverbs. Right. Like it right. just it's universal wisdom. I could see like a grandpa on a front porch just with a pipe, just reading the Book of Proverbs to his kid for sure. And and, <laughs> and, 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 and even when that grandpa's long gone, that wisdom will still apply. It'll still work. Right, right. Uh, so that's why I like Proverbs. And then my fifth book. Um, I would say is James. I believe it. Yeah. Uh, re- and the reason why I would say James is because uh, James was very like clear cut and just to the point, man. Yeah, uh, he wasn't. Gonna, I, he didn't have time for you. Yeah, yeah, he, yeah. He was he was very clear cut to the point, and he and he, and he was ultimately just like, hey, uh, you know, you you claim you claim to to be a Christian, you claim to be a follower of Christ. Well, didn't act like it. He could have stopped right then and there, but he didn't. He, Probably, yeah. He was no need for an epistle. I'll just give you a little post-it note. Yeah, but that's that's kind of that 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 was his epistle. It was, hey, you you claim to be a follower of Christ? Well, then act like it. This is this is how followers of Christ behave themselves. Do that, mm-hmm. and I appreciate that. Beautiful. Those what about you? Some fine suggestions of our uh, of our biblical catalog we could choose from. Yeah, yeah, I actually ahead. have two in common with you, and then a few that are a little bit different. So go for it. Uh, my favorite one out of the whole thing would probably be Genesis, mm-hmm. just like you. Mm-hmm. Um, but for different reasons, I would agree with everything that you said. I think one of the things is I feel like there's so many ways that you can view and interpret, especially like the first like 11 or so books of the Bible, 
or uh, of Genesis, uh, first chapters, I should say. Yeah. Um, and I think there's just like an immense, unending well of wisdom within them. For sure. Every time, like I look at the Garden or Cain and Abel, and some of these really like prehistorical sort of books in Genesis, it's just like mind blowing, like how much that well just keeps getting deeper and deeper the more I look into it. Uh-huh. Um, I mean, Cain and Abel's like. 12 verses or something but it's just never ending like what you could pull out of it yeah jordan peterson talks about that story yeah. so much yeah he can't shut up about it yeah which like you say it's only 12 verses but dude it's i mean it's so much information in those yeah. 12 verses like i said do you can go to genesis and you can find every single issue mm-hmm. that we deal with in humanity right now yeah you can find it in genesis yeah and i think another reason i really like genesis is because you can see this general literary structure that's used in certain parts of genesis yep. and how it's almost used as a literary we could say style in other areas of the bible especially like with jesus's uh parables and mm-hmm. jesus's uh sermons and things like that mm-hmm. i was always pointing back to genesis or you'll see things like for example um I think it's the parable of the prodigal son. He does something very similar to Cain and Abel, where he's juxtaposing two characters mm-hmm. against each other, as almost as like opposites. Sure. And you know, there's all these like little things that you could just kind of find and connect from Genesis to mm-hmm. the New Testament. So I think it's just like a really cool text in general. Yeah. You could do that with John chapter one too, in Genesis chapter one. Oh, oh yeah, 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 exactly. Mm-hmm. So, uh, which brings me to my next book, John. Um, I, again, I like it for a lot of the same stuff you were saying for mm-hmm. sure. Um. I think I like it because it seems to be a more cosmic view on the gospels and or on the the gospel story we could say. Um, like right away the the synoptic gospels get right to the historical stuff immediately. Mm-hmm. But John kind of like peels back the layers on the story a lot by going all the way to the beginning. Not the beginning of his genealogy like the other three. It goes back to the beginning of, of time essence. itself. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> and um You know, I mean, just reading that first half of the first chapter of the book of John, it's just very eye-opening that, like, this is a very unique text. It's it's pretty freaking epic, isn't it? Yeah, and I think it's One of the best intros, like, in scripture. Like, it's it's pretty cool, like, how he words that and puts it together. Yeah, and I think uh, introducing the idea of the word logos, and John is kind of taking this term and this view that's used in the Greco-Roman world from, like, philosophers from Socrates to Aristotle in that time and people building on that concept along with um, people, I can't remember the name of the philosopher's name, but um, the Stoics and all of these people mm-hmm. kind of deliberating on what this term meant and looking at it in like a platonic sense. But now John is kind of taking this word logos and applying it to Christ that Jesus is like the um, personification, the, the personification of the truth of objective reality of the, the organizing force that, um, that brings together uh, order out of chaos and things like that. A lot of really, really just cool uh, things. This is just in like the first sentence and like, he's just drawing these things together. And I think it's cool how he's, it's, it's kind of a really cool way that, you know, if you think about the old Testament is for the Jews and then the new Testament is sending the Jews out to evangelize the whole world. Mm -hmm. I like how John is doing that in a way that it's tying the Greco Roman world in right away. Like, Mm -hmm. Hey, you guys are like coming into the divine family now. And here's how we're going to do that. Because a lot of the things that you're studying and learning and teaching is true. And I want to show you how the aspects of that actually point to an even greater reality than you're currently ascertaining right now. Right. You know, I mean, that's why I really love, Greco-Roman philosophy in general. Mm-hmm. There's so many things that are just pointing to some sort of transcendent reality beyond them. I mean, mm-hmm. like, like, like the Platonic forms and with a lot of the things Socrates says in the dialogues, all that sort of stuff. There's mm-hmm. a lot of things that are just pointing up and I think John is kind of saying like, yeah, you're looking up, you just got to look a little bit higher and notice the, the Christ-shaped hole in the cosmos that you haven't seen yet. So mm-hmm. that's why I like John a lot. Mm-hmm. And if I had to pick a third book, I'd probably pick the Book of Psalms. And this is less for theological reasons and more for personal reasons in terms of like, it's just a very, very good book to get, um, to use as a vessel for prayer in general. For sure. Like, it's really cool just to kind of pray through or pray over the Psalms in general. I mean, there's a never, there's a very diverse perspective within the Psalms. I mean, you have people who are crying out for God. There's people who are yelling at God. Um, I mean, there's really cool theology within it. And then there's just really cool structure in general. I mean, you have really cool literary patterns. Um, all, And then there's what I like about the Book of Psalms. It just keeps pointing out to other books in the Old Testament in uh-huh. general, you know. Mm-hmm. Uh, so those would be my top three. And mm-hmm. then I was trying to pick 
uh, a couple other notable mentions. Uh, I'm they're kind of for funny reasons, but go for the it. Book of Revelation because it's the one I understand the least. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, there's so much allegory and views on that, and I feel like there's a lot of the fancy term would be, um, oh, what's the word I'm looking for? <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to th- I'm trying to think of a um, uh, a scholarly way to say stupid. Um, mm. oh. counterintuitive. That's the term I was looking for. There's a lot of counterintuitive readings of Revelation with like saying the end of the world is coming every 15 years and stuff like that and yeah. the rapture and all this sort of stuff. Yeah. And like there's a lot of there's a lot of interesting theories out there. But mm-hmm. when you really start to look at like how the early church looked at the book of Revelation, it kind of just blew my mind. Like I'm not going to get into all of that now cuz that's that's like a whole episode's worth. But like it's it's a very very cosmic view and summation of the Bible and a way to look at liturgy in general. It's it's a cool book that I very understand very very little. Mm-hmm. And like the more I look at it, I was like I'm like what's happening here? I feel like everything's on fire yeah, in a it's in a, a terrifying and beautiful way. It's a lot of moving parts, that's for sure. And it's funny because you know you know skeptics always talk about how oh the the Old Testament you know God seems so vengeful and angry and it mm-hmm. seems very bloody. Yeah, okay. The bloodiest book in the Bible hasn't happened yet, guys. Right, right. Yeah, that's Revelation. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, if I had to pick a fifth one, probably be Judges. Okay. That's my notable mention, because, uh, for one, a lot of drama. I mean, they should make a movie out of the book of Judges. I feel like they have. <laughs> right, no, I mean like a literal book of Judges movie. Oh. Not like in an be, allegorical be sense. 350 years long. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I, I like it just because uh, there's a really cool literary structure where, like, there's this pattern of people messing up, mm-hmm. asking for forgiveness, mm-hmm. God grants them forgiveness, and then they mess up in a bigger way, and they just keep, it's just cycling just, out into yep. more and more one, chaos. One big circle, which which also, which also kind of reflects um, their journey in the wilderness in yeah. Exodus. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's a good way to think about it, too. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think it's just kind of cool that they have, like, these... Uh, very heroic women in in the Bible, just like killing these like evil dudes in the beginning, like Deborah and mm-hmm. uh, Judith is the other one. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so very very interesting stuff in the book. It's just an exciting book to read, for lack of better terms. And, it, it and, I'm not, and the the ending of the book is very very chaotic and theatrical. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, these quite scary too. Yeah, the, it's definitely scary. I mean, obviously, like these horrible things that have happened in the book, they're like sad to read about, but it's also like, oh my god, this is like. I mean, this is like drama TV right mm-hmm. here. So for sure, yeah. So yeah, they should make more make it like a reality TV, like a reality TV show for the Book of Judges versus like a movie. Mm-hmm. That'd be wild. Yeah, right. Yeah. I mean, they that could be fun for sure. I, I think we have some work to do after this episode. <laughs> right, we need some funding. Um, so that's it for this, then, huh? Hey, appreciate it, guys. Thanks for watching this content. We appreciate, as always, uh, continue to like, share, subscribe, uh, follow us on YouTube, follow us on Facebook, TikTok. Uh, We're continuing to grow and grow and grow. But until next time, I am your co-host, Jalen Thompson. Dylan Schweitzer. And as always, for the kingdom, we out.